talk to you today about history and memory on Robben Island, um, which is in South Africa. We all engage in memory work, but history, or that is our understandings and interpretations of it, plays a central role in framing our acts of remembering. My interest in Africa's past has led me to consider how history and memory are viewed as very different beasts, and at times, one and the same, both on the continent and in the African diaspora. We know that history and memory both matter for identities and communities. How we remember helps us to make sense of our past, ground us in the present, and prepare us for the future. Indeed, the ways in which we remember and forget shape and shift our interpretations of history, of change over time, of disruption, and of continuity. History is representation, and cultural memories are deployed to benefit certain groups over others. Traditions, or traditions in quotation marks, turn into honored cultural institutions. National myths emerge from a blend of history and memory, fact and fiction. These myths are often quite inauthentic, but they become authentic and highly symbolic, often appearing to be natural. Public memory, at times ambiguous, is promoted by the state, in some instances vehemently when the state is highly concerned about controlling it. Yet often there are competing narratives that manage to slowly erode national myths over the long array or swiftly override them in a flash during political and economic transitions. Moments of transformation, such as the time surrounding South Africa's attainment of full independence in 1994, provide us with evidence to examine how disclosure and silence, both public and private, work in shaping social representations of history. So the setting for this paper is Robben Island. And here's an aerial view of the island, um, looking off towards Cape Town and Table Mountain in the background. Robben Island is the site of one of South Africa's most notorious prisons. Although the island near Cape Town has been used as a prison since the 16th century, it's known in our public memory as the site that held political prisoners who opposed the apartheid regime during the second half of the 20th century. So it held political prisoners there from 1961 to uh, 1991. It is the African Alcatraz, to give a North American Nelson Mandela is the most famous former prisoner, but there are many other leaders of the anti-apartheid struggle who endured the harsh conditions of confinement and forced labor in the quarry on Robben Island. These include Robert Sabukwe, Walter Sisulu, Ahmed Kathrada, and the current president of South Africa, Jacob Zuma. This one piece of land at the edge of the southern tip of the country emerged in the 1990s to encompass a national memory after the release of all of these political prisoners. My focus in this paper is on the histories and memories that swirl around Robben Island, like the rough surf breaking on its rocky shoreline. The politics of remembering that surround the island and its past uses are as fraught as the unsuccessful attempts of South Africans over the centuries to escape from confinement there. The island is a significant site of memory, a physical space that reflects legacies of racism and oppression, while also marking the eventual triumph of the liberation struggle against apartheid. The concept of sites of memory emerged from the scholarship of the historian Pierre Nora, who argued that spaces rooted in memory replaced traditional forms of memory. Nora has criticized historians for their heavy focus on social structures and what he saw as a lack of sympathy to the countless subjective and local views. Likewise, I argue that attention to realms of memory can reveal multiple important voices that need to be heard and analyzed. Nora's influential work on sites of memory in France, Vieux de Memoir, suggests that history is suspicious of memory and dead set against it. For Nora, memory, instil memory installs remembrance within the sacred. History, always prosaic, releases it again. Nora's work on memory has highlighted some of the assumptions and problems that are associated with the cultivation of heritage in the making of national or regional pasts. A growing group of scholars from an array of disciplines have enriched the concerns raised by Nora with their contributions over the past decade or so, including a substantial number who focus on Africa. Robben Island, like the former slave forts in West Africa, is a burdened site of memory since the island graphically and viscerally embodies both the horrors of political repression and the victory of surviving against the odds. 
This is um, what Annie Coombs argues in, in her work on public memory after apartheid. The website of the Robben Island Museum, which was opened in January 1997, and this is just a screenshot here of the, the homepage of the website, which coincidentally does not show any images of former uh, political prisoners on its, on its homepage. This website notes that the histories and memories emerging from Robben Island serve as, and I'm quoting here, a poignant reminder to the newly democratic South Africa of the price paid for freedom. So that's what you see up in bold there at the top in the middle. But how does the recent wave of tourists to the island, which has been a UNESCO World Heritage Site since 1999, affect the legitimization of the South African state? What is the state's relationship with the public memory surrounding the island, given the deep connections of the African National Congress, the ANC, to this space? Although the political prisoners were released with the fall of apartheid, the walls still house a history of overlapping and competing perspectives. In this project, which is an ongoing one, I'll give you that caveat this morning, I'm analyzing how the state and others remember and manipulate both history and memory on Robben Island, where the physical remnants of the prison and the surrounding terrain serve as living histories to be interpreted by former prisoners and guards, local South Africans, and many foreign tourists. Harriet Deacon has convincingly argued that the significance of the island today lies not so much in what actually happened there as in how its history has been interpreted and represented. My investigation of the intersections between history and memory draws on methods that include participant observation from various site visits, a consideration of past uses of the island, analysis of the public and official presentation of the island's history, and the reflections of visitors and former prisoners. This is an image here of Nelson Mandela's cell on Robben Island. There's a powerful mythology surrounding Robben Island that clouds and also shrouds it. And I think this cell, it, it really embodies that, what I'm about to say now. Harry Garuba has observed that the island is one of those over-textualized places, and, and a, a site which becomes impossible to see or to narrate without the conditioning of prior texts and discourses. Robben Island plays a central role in the dominant narrative of the liberation struggle, and former prisoners talk of leaving the island with a university degree, becoming men in this gendered and politicized space. The Robben Island Museum website notes that this educational philosophy involved, quote, strategies for a future society based on tolerance, respect, and non-racialism that were nurtured and implemented by political prisoners. The emphasis on education, debate, and on lifelong learning is a testimony to the fight for justice and education and is a key to Rival Island's role as a heritage site and its human rights discourse. That's the end of the quote. According to Deacon, former prisoners brokered this interpretation of the island as the crucible of change in South Africa. Indeed, um, Motlani, one of South Africa's former presidents, reflected in an interview in 1992, um, and he said, we were a community of people who ranged from the totally illiterate to people who could very easily have been professors at universities. We shared basically everything. The years out there were the most productive years in one's life. We were able to read, we read all the material that came our way, took an interest in the lives of people even in the remotest corners of the world. To me, those years gave meaning to life. End of quote. So we can see here how meaning is given to life and also to myth. The discourse surrounding Robben Island suggests at first glance that there was one apartheid, the apartheid of the Afrikaner or of the Boer, fought by one adversary, the African National Congress or the ANC. But it becomes clear that there were many apartheids, the large and the small, that were attacked by a multitude of brave men and women from various groups that made up the anti-apartheid movement seeking freedom. So there are various personal and public memories of the island, memories which are often unequal in scope and in power. And this reality has led to a contested symbolism surrounding the island and eddies of debate that are now part of a broader contest over the structure and the meaning of the New South Africa and how the New South Africa interprets its past. The memory pools around Robben Island run deep. And this notion of memory pools is something that I got from reading Joyce Carol Oates in The New Yorker. So I'm, I'm, I'm shocked at how often I find things in The New Yorker that relate to my research. There you go. In South Africa, there's an active tradition of probing the relationships between memory and history, with 
within the academy, the heritage sector, the heritage heritage sector, and in public discourse. Um, one scholar has noted in her recent work on slavery I mean, in South Africa um, that it's pretty amazing to kind of write a book about this and realize that it's going on every day around you, you know, on the streets and the farms of South Africa. In South Africa, oral history is supported, it's promoted, and it's respected alongside a post-apartheid push to reveal the working of the apartheid state and the working of the, op of the opponents to the state during the, that period. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission is evidence of this sentiment to air some of the dirty laundry rather than keep the skeletons in the wardrobe of South Africa's past. Of course, some dirty laundry remains out of sight alongside a good number of bones in the nation's closet one can just look behind some of those high walls of the fine homes or in the yards of modest township dwellings to find secrets, repressed memories, virulent extremism, and wildly divergent interpretations of South Africa's history. One bold example of drawing from memory pools in an attempt to engage in memory work related to Robben Island is the use of former political prisoners as guides on the island. And this is one former political prisoner serving as a guide um, standing there in front of a um, an iconic photo um, on Robben Island. By employing former inhabitants of the prison, Robben Island Museum is attempting to give voice through narrative. And yet, there's not likely to be a space for truly personal experiences to emerge in the narratives of the tour guides of Robben Island who had been inmates in the prison. This is according to the work of Harry Garuba. Um, he argues that the dominant public narrative of the anti-apartheid struggle structures a discourse and overshadows individual agency, and that's what I've seen in my research as well. The complicated nature of history also interferes with a very packaged museum narrative. Those of you in museum studies can just think about you know, how, how difficult it is to take everything and transfer it into this package narrative that you get with the price of admission ticket. So despite this paradox noted by Garuba of having former political prisoners as objects on display that are also subjects with a speaking voice, the collective memory of the struggle dominates the experience of visitors to the island. And I just had to show you this one as well. I, I took this off of a, uh, a website, kind of a you know, travel guide to South Africa, someone saying, look, um, here was my tour guide, a former political prisoner, and then they've circled in the photograph um, where he was uh, you know, decades ago um, on this one boat bringing the prisoners back to the mainland when they were Garuba himself is a South African academic, and he's written about his own initial unease about the use of former inmates as tour guides. He questioned the logic of making the sufferers tell the story of their personal pain all over again and again, several times a day, to an audience of tourists. He thus explored how individual memories relate to larger questions of memory, subjectivity, and agency. And as difficult as it may be to ask former prisoners to interact with tourists, this seems to me a more appropriate uh, situation than one I encountered earlier in 1999, just as Robben Island was declared a national world heritage site and as more people were beginning to visit the island as, as tourism was um, ramping up. During that visit, which was before the construction of the Nelson Mandela Gateway on the, the mainland, our former prison guard operated a small gift shop at the modest ferry terminal on the mainland. Although I can see the value of including this white man in the public face of the island's past. There seemed to be no accountability in his current role of selling trinkets on the waterfront. Here was an upholder of the apartheid regime, now exploiting his former role after the closure of the prison, after the end of this era uh, for capitalist gain. And, and to me, that, that felt unsettling. In considering post-colonial memory, specifically memories after the end of apartheid, I'm concerned with the ongoing effects of processing of historical consciousness. Specifically, I want to question how this state has sought to shape the public memory surrounding Robben Island for audiences that are both local and global, domestic and international. One of the first things that may not come to mind when you think of Robben Island is slavery. Um, you most likely think of you know, these former political prisoners who um, were incarcerated there. It's because this more recent use of the island as a prison for, for political prisoners jailed during the apartheid regime is so much more familiar to the modern world. And slavery itself in South Africa has only surfaced recently in the landscape of popular culture, prompting some to examine this recent visibility of slave memory in South Africa's past. Slaves were imprisoned on the island as part of a pattern of imprisonment and banishment there since the 17th century. Um, the 
This was a place of isolation, of imprisonment, and of, of banishment over time. And even though South Africans have actively shaped their own memories and their ties to Robben Island, the site is frozen in a particular period for many people during the time of the imprisonment of Nelson Mandela. This telescoping of the island to its recent use as this maximum security prison since 1961 allows the island in a sense to escape from these earlier histories and even more recent developments since Mandela's transfer to a prison on the mainland. The island was used in the 18th century to detain the worst criminals and the most dangerous political opponents of the Dutch East India Company. And in the 19th century, the island housed a hospital for lepers, the insane, and the sick poor. And the last patients were removed in 1931. Attempts to recast this, the island and its symbolic meaning occurred once before, um, not just in the 1990s, but also in the mid-19th century. At that time, there was a call to reform the island asylum on humanitarian grounds and attempts to promote it as a place of cures rather than banishment. Um, middle class women were encouraged to go to the island to recover from their bouts of whatever it was um, that was going on. Scholars have documented the contested future of Robben Island over the course of the 20th century. This has included calls to transform the island into a leisure resort, um, into a peace center, or a nature reserve. But given the island's great political and symbolic value for the anti-apartheid movement, the apartheid regime relocated many imprisoned leaders in 1982 to the mainland to minimize the significance of the island as a site of resistance. So um, here's this poster and here's a, a quote um, from one of the former prisoners, Ahmed Kathrara, that's um, going to embody some of what I want to say now. Even though this symbol of oppression and injustice no longer houses political prisoners, Robert Island has helped to legitimize the post-apartheid state since the 1990s by proclaiming that activists as survivors have triumphed. Okay, and you see this word triumph in the quote here. These former prisoners moved from behind bars to the front of the nation as prominent leaders and government officials. Some of the most memorable images of Mandela include his February 1990 Walk of Freedom after his release from a prison in Cape Town and the casting of his own ballot during the first non-racial democratic elections in 1994. The mere existence of the prison on Robert Island, as a former prison today, evokes that political prisoner turned narrative of other newly independent African states, such as the Congo with Patrice Lumumba, Kenya with Jomo Kenyatta, and Ghana with Kwame Nkrumah. The liberation of prisoners becomes a symbol of national liberation, and a signal that these men are prepared, through their participation in that university of the struggle, to lead the nation. Political significance emerges from the personal experiences of former South African prisoners and some serve as cultural brokers that help to redefine the public image of the island through the publication of prisoner memoirs and interviews in the press. Now there are many cases of governments attempting to control heritage sites and representations of history associated with them. Um, and even though most South Africans have not visited Robben Island, the island stood out in the public memory as a place to celebrate victory rather than to commemorate martyrs. With the country transformed into a new South Africa, the rainbow nation, as South Africans like to say, the island was remade to mark the end of apartheid and celebrate the achievement of democracy, and forecast the hopes for South Africa's future. Thus, Robert Island has come to be forward-looking and symbolize the future of South Africa rather than its past. And here are a group of school children gathered around looking at an aerial view of the island, you know, learning about Robben Island, and learning, talking, I'm sure, about South Africa's future not just South Africa's past. Robben Island played an important and contested role in the shaping of public memory during South Africa's transition to democracy in the 1990s, in part by glossing over personal memories in favor of constructing this forward-looking meta-narrative. Conversely, there's a privately run museum of apartheid in Johannesburg that may actually preserve some personal memories as it tries to construct a public memory that does, not, that does look back in time, despite the fact that scholars have convincingly argued that heritage is actually something new, even though it looks old. And I don't have time to get into that here, but that's the subtext of what I'm, what I'm arguing and what I think we've seen with the other presentations today. So what does it mean to remember on Robert Island today? A place where apartheid is exposed in some of its nakedness. Well, for South Africans and for, former visitor, for foreign visitors, there are histories and memories of the past that confront issues of morality and race as the island is used to build South Africa's future. There are public heritage programs of the Robben Island Museum that include school tours, independent camps, photograph on the left of an independent camp there, 
nation building youth camps, and they use that term, nation building. Um, there's an aim to develop a sense of citizenship in young people, and I'm quoting from the museum, based on a culture of human rights and responsibilities. There's also a resource center on the island for researchers and interns, and uh, public outreach that includes the staging of a play in 2010, and this is an image on the right from, from that play. One might argue that the island now houses what is at the heart of the new South Africa. The state, however, uses the island to build a future out of a stock narrative of public memories that at times erase personal ones. What would we think of Robben Island if Mandela was not in prison for so many years though? Mandela is so deeply rooted in South Africa's recent past, so essential to its histories and its memories, so enshrined and angelic that he's rendered in a sense untouchable yet so very touchable, as in seeming very approachable, by people around the world. From concerts in Europe, um, in his honor, to YouTube clips, to Nelson Mandela Avenue in New York City, Mandela is this icon, this hero, this statesman, this revered elder, this family man, among many other things. His name is also synonymous with Robert Island and the public memory surrounding it. But does this obscure other histories and other prisoners? Not perhaps, since Mandela represents every man, every prisoner. His sheer likability, his natural grace, his gravitas, his spirit of resistance have allowed him to be the face in front of so many other unnamed others who suffered the same injustice and fought against the same indignities. Mandela's popularity and connection to the island brings tourists to, to the museum where they learn more about South Africa's past than they would on a safari. The mainland departure point for a ferry to the island is called the Nelson Mandela Gateway. This is a view of it here. Um, the upper right, you can just see it says Nelson Mandela Gateway to Robben Island, um, a beautiful new, new structure that was um, officially opened in 2001 by Mandela. This, the name of the gateway itself says something about the connection um, that Mandela has to, to the island. Upon arriving at the gateway, in a sense, you have access to a part of Mandela, okay? access to his cell block on the island, to a view of his most intimate yet public space for 17 years on the island. So Mandela's personal becomes public through the viewing of his cell. The connection of the place of Robben Island is made through the person of Mandela. And I see I'm being told to wrap up, which is good because we're going. My last um, point I want to make is that uh, one group of tourists I observed in, in 19, uh, 2007 considered abandoning their plans to visit the island when they were told that Mandela's cell was closed for renovations. They were quite vocal um, about their dismay at the state of affairs. Um, and these are views of the closed cell block there. Um, and they asked the local South African, um, why didn't you tell us before we bought our tickets? Um, there were several signs that noted this in the gateway, but I guess they hadn't seen them. And they were prepared to leave the queue for the ferry and go get a refund for their tickets. Uh, the South African who made the announcement reminded them that there were other cell blocks to visit that house additional political prisoners, this being the one that they saw on the tour. The information was delivered, it seems, as a reproach, and it prompted them to remain in, remain in line and board the ferry and, and take the tour um, of the island. This incident is just one example of how Mandela's ties to the island bind him so tightly to the meanings and the memories that surround it. Okay. So um, in conclusion, I want to say that Robben Island is this physical space, but it's also a location for situating nationness. The island is a symbol of national transformation and a symbol of the new nation. This symbolic importance has important cons has consequences for national identity in South Africa. But the prominent symbolism of Robben Island also binds it so closely to Mandela and it superimposes a meta-narrative of the public or his private con public over the personal. Even the former political prisoners who serve as tour guides cannot overcome the stagecraft. Robben Island is a politically sensitive site that the state has managed to situate into the public memory as a national symbol of a promising future emerging out of a tragic past. With memory as a site of struggle for liberation and ideological contestation, history takes a back seat here to the drama playing out on Robin Island. Thank you.